You will be aware that this is, the, this is Darwin year, the bicentennial of Charles Darwin's birth and the sesquicentennial of publication of The Origin of Species. And timed for this year, you will also know that an extremely significant and important book has appeared on the evidence for evolution. That book is, of course, Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne, who is our next speaker. Uh, professor of genetics in the University of Chicago, uh, I have come to regard him since the death, the, the sad death of John Maynard Smith as the principal guru to go to on evolutionary genetics in the world. And it's a very great pleasure to introduce Jerry Coyne to speak today. Thanks, Richard. It's an honor to be invited here by Richard and also by the AAI and to have so many people interested in not only my talk, but talks about science. Uh, my purview here is to talk about um, the theme of the conference, which is Darwinism in particular, as Richard said. Um, the evidence, oh, can you not hear me? I, the mic's up about, is, oh, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's sliding down my freshly start shirt. Um, the Evidence for Evolution, of course, there's another book out which Richard was too humble to mention, but you'll hear about it later, The Greatest Show on Earth. And we cover overlapping, but fortunately um, not too overlapping areas of biology. Anyway, when I heard from Richard, I got a letter um, telling me what he would like to see me talk about. He asked me to put a positive approach to the beauties of the world of science in the talk. And I presume this is in reaction to the sort of negative image that we atheist scientists have amongst the public. We're always nattering on about horrible creationists and um, we're always trying to take people's religion away from them. And so I want to give a sort of positive aspect to evolutionary biology and make it palatable to people. And that's what I'm going to do today by way of presenting what the evidence for evolution really is. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not going to bash creationism very much. PZ did a really good job of that, PZ Myers, yesterday. I'm going to talk pretty much about what the evidence for evolution is. But I have to cast this in the context because you're not going to see anybody up here giving a talks about the evidence for atoms or the evidence for pathogenic bacteria, stuff that was accepted 100 years ago, like evolution was 150 years ago. Why am I bothering to get up here and talk about stuff that we already knew was true a century and a half ago? And the reason is this, particularly in the United States, that the acceptance of the evolutionary biology is far less than the acceptance of the existence of atoms or pathogenic bacteria. If you line up, say, 34 technologically advanced countries, in terms of their acceptance of evolution, each country is on the left, running down, I think, from Iceland to the bottom. Um, and look at the percentage of people that accept evolution, which is in blue, not so sure, in um, tan and false and red, you'll see the countries line up, and here's where the United States is. We're 33rd out of 34th countries, just above Turkey, which is somewhat of a fundamentalist Islamic country, and right below Cyprus. So this is a pretty abysmal position for us to be in, given that we're, at least we think of ourselves, as a technologically advanced society. Okay, why is this? Why are we so advanced? We just heard a great lecture on stem cell research, a lot of it in this country. Why so low in evolution? Well, I think you know the answer to that, but I'll defer that bashing to the end of the talk. Um, one clue might be that because we're always fighting rear guard action against evolution because of people trying to keep it out of the schools, and most of those people, as was true in the Dover trial in 2005, are motivated by religious motives. Okay. That's all the creation bashing for now. What I want to talk about is a lot of stuff that's limbed in my book, Why Evolution is True. I understand it's on purchase outside, although I haven't seen it. And I'm going to tell you what the evidence for evolution is. But before I do that, I have to tell you what scientists mean by when they say something is true. And when we say the theory of evolution is true, what do we mean by a theory? And what do we mean by the theory of evolution? And then I want to present the evidence for why that theory is true in a scientific sense. And I'm doing this for several reasons. I don't think I need to convince people in this audience that evolution is true. You wouldn't be here otherwise. 
But perhaps you don't have the armamentarium of evidence under your belts to talk to your neighbors or your relatives about why it's true. The second reason is that maybe you don't realize how multifarious this evidence really is. It's not just the fossil record. It comes from six or seven different areas of biology, all of them confluent in this truth of the hypothesis that Darwin proposed 150 years ago. And finally, the evidence for evolution is just really cool stuff. It's interesting, it's amazing, it's astounding, it's staggering. And that's what my book is about, that's what Richard's book is about. So that's what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk. First of all, I have to get clear what we mean by a scientific fact. What do we mean when we say that something is true scientifically? We don't mean true beyond all possible doubt in the absolute truth sense. We mean, and I believe this definition was first raised by Stephen Jay Gould, it's an assertion for which there is so much evidence that it would be perverse to deny it. And by that, I mean that those people who are capable of judging the evidence, if almost all of them say that that's true, then it's true, and that's what we mean in science. So when I say something in science is true, it's like this desk is true. There may be some philosophers out there that say, well, just because I can knock on this and make a sound doesn't mean that this thing is really there, but the vast majority of you would agree that this desk is there, and I'm sitting, standing behind a lectern, and I will try to propose that there's as much evidence for evolution as there is for the fact that this lectern is here before you. Okay, and so that kind of evidence is true for atoms. You'd have to be perverted to deny that atoms were the constituents of elements. Um, there are some people out there undoubtedly who don't, but who do deny it, but they're a minority. Same with pathogenic bacteria. And the evolution falls in that class as well. I will maintain that evolution is just as true in the sense I mentioned as are the existence of atoms as the constituents of elements and pathogenic bacteria for causing disease like strep throat and gonorrhea, okay? Now, evolution is a theory, it's called a theory, but it's a theory in the scientific sense in which it's not just a wild speculation or a guess, like it's my theory that the Cubs have a good chance next year, which is a really bad hypothesis, not a theory. It's a, it's a group of, it's a group of uh, propositions meant to explain something about nature, and that's what Darwin proposed in 1859. I'll tell you the constituents of the theory of evolution in a minute. So evolution began life as a theory, really formally in 1858, when Darwin and Wallace first wrote about it. And what happens is that a theory, that one in 1858, begins to gradually attain facthood as more and more pieces of evidence come down in favor of it, and, more, and no evidence is found to refute it. Okay? So a theory becomes fact, Evolution has become a fact, and I will maintain that you are perverse, or you're a moron, or you simply can't understand the nature of evidence, or you're so blinded by religious considerations that you just reject all evidence, um, if you do not see that evolution is true. Okay, that's my um, fulmination for the moment. Now on to the positive stuff, the evidence for evolution. Okay, first we have to know what the theory of evolution is, and if you ask somebody, um, an average educated person, what the theory of evolution is, they won't be able to answer. They'll just say things evolve. And that's one of the parts of evolution, but it's not all of it. There's actually what I call five constituents of the theory, some of which hang together, some of which are independent of one another, all of which have to be tested and verified if you're going to say that this package that we call the theory of evolution is true. Okay, what are they? First of all, evolution occurs. Populations change over time. And by change, I mean they change genetically. The genetic constituents of a population, the kind of DNA that is shared by members of that population, undergoes temporal change. Second of all, that change is not instantaneous, but gradual. It varies. I mean, evolution can occur on scales of 10 years or 100 years, and more likely thousands to millions of years, but it does not happen overnight, except in very rare cases. So we're not talking about an instantaneous genetic change that changes like the population of dinosaurs into a population of birds. That was once thought to be the way evolution occurred. We no longer think that that's true. So that's part two. Now remember, these are somewhat independent. You can verify that things evolve, but the fact that they evolve gradually, they don't have to. They can change overnight. Okay, two independent propositions. Third, and this is my own area of expertise, speciation occurs. You don't just see one lineage changing over time. Instead, you see lineages branch. Here's a case of what we call splitting. The formal word is speciation, where original lineage A branches into two new descendant species, B 
and C. And that usually takes a long amount of time. And this is the way that starting with the single ancestral species, somewhere about three and a half billion years ago, we arrive at today's count of 10 million to 50 million species on Earth. You could not do that unless you had this branching process. This is what's responsible for the tree of life. There's a nice tree of life t-shirts outside that you can buy. Okay, and again, this has to be verified separately from evolution. We could have evolution, but no speciation. In that case, we'd have a long evolved single species that was the descendant of the first species to occur. Now, this is proposition four, which is sort of the reverse side of looking at proposition three. That is, if you have a splitting process, but you look at it backwards, and again, this is what Richard did in Ancestors Tale, you see that you have common ancestors that every pair of species on Earth, no matter how closely or distantly related, if you go back far enough into the past, you'll find a single ancestral species that gave rise to them both. So this is Proposition 4, which you can look at as 3B, the reverse side of speciation. All species share a common ancestry as a result of lineage splitting from one ancestral life form. This, for example, is the family tree of primates. You can see the many splitting events evolved in the common ancestors. Our common ancestor with the chimp was about 7 million years ago, with the gorilla about 11 million years ago, with um, the lemurs about 40 to 50 billion years ago. So, and, and we could extend this back further and further and find common ancestors with birds, with frogs, with dandelions. Okay. And finally, the last part of evolutionary theory, and in many ways a very important one, is what causes evolution. And I will maintain that the vast amount of evolutionary change, although this is subject to dispute, is the result of the process of natural selection, the so-called survival of the fittest. And I will maintain that natural selection, or at least as part of the theory, is the sole process that can produce the appearance of design organisms, the appearance of things that look as though God put them there to help the animal, like the elephant's trunk, the camel's hump, the polar bear's coat, and so on. So those are the five parts of evolutionary theory. And what I'm going to do now is show you the evidence that all of these five parts are true. Okay. And I hope you accept it at the end. And if you don't, you shouldn't be here for the first place. <laughs> I really feel like I'm preaching to the choir so much. I'm, why am I doing this? But I, I like it. That's right. What can I say? Um, so evolution is a scientific theory. It makes predictions. If you just read Darwin's first paper before his book, before he gave any evidence one year before in 1858, you could predict from what Darwin said the following. If life originated in the earth in the distant past and then evolved, subsequently splitting, we should see that the first detectable traces of life on earth would be simple. You cannot start life from chemicals in a complex way. You don't get an elephant springing out of a primordial ooze, and only later would more complex forms evolve. The simplest prediction you can make. If you look at the fossil record, which is now ordered not only relatively, but absolutely, we know all the layers and we know all the dates that go with the layers, you see that it absolutely conforms to that prediction. We see the first real organisms on Earth that are undisputed are these cyanobacteria or blue-green algae that appear about 3.4 billion years ago, only about a billion years after the Earth was formed. And then more and more complex creatures form, shelled animals, land plants, fish, reptiles, and amphibians, one after the other, in an order which is almost predictable from looking at them today. Um, and the simpler forms remain. It's not that the simpler forms are there and go away. We still have shellfish with us. We still have bacteria. We still have fish. But more and more complicated things come in on top of that. This absolutely violates the prediction that all life was created at one time and never changed again. Um, completely refuting what the Discovery Institute or most creationist um, organizations maintain. Okay. This alone should be enough to refute creationism. But, but as they say in the Ginsu knife ads, but wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> all right. Another prediction is that if evolution occurs within lineages and those lineages sometimes split, then we should be able to see that in the fossil record. We shouldn't just be able to see this progression from simple organisms to complex ones with the simpler ones remaining. We should be able to say, trace a single lineage and see it changing over time. After all, that's what evolution is. And we should be able to see those lineages split so that we have an ancestor that divides into several descendants. And lo and behold, I could give you three or four hundred cases of this, but I'll just give you a couple. 
to hopefully convince you of this. Um, some of the best evidence for evolution in the fossil record are, are found from marine microfossils, which are these tiny planktonic organisms that live in the sea. And why they're so good for evolution is, first of all, they usually have hard skeletons. Second of all, when they die, they just fall to the bottom, automatically ensuring that they l lie in the sediments. The sediments cover them up and preserve them. And you can get these whole groups of them, organisms. You can take a time slice of a single lineage of these organisms by simply drilling the core through the seafloor and then slicing that core into pieces, dating them, and seeing, following the lineage and how it looks and seeing how it changes. And here's one of them, a very simple organism. It's a diatom, a marine protist um, with a calcareous skeleton. And we can see that over the, the 1.7 million year slice of time, on the left here, and this is one characteristic of that, which is the size of the thing, an aspect of its size, that we see some evolutionary change happening. Sometimes it gets smaller, sometimes it gets bigger, smaller, bigger. Evolution doesn't always have to be unidirectional. There's no God propelling this. It's the environment, and the environment changes. So we see evolution here, but more important in this case, if we follow the core down, we see this as well, that we see the instant at which one lineage divides into two. That's not so easy in the fossil record, given the difficulty of fossilization. But in marine microfossils, it's easy. And lo and behold, what do we see? Evolution and speciation. And this lineage itself evolves, becoming smaller over the 1.5 million years that it exists. OK, and I could give you case after case after case. I mean, if you're a creationist, you'd tell me, so what? These are just diatoms. Give me something interesting, like a mammal, and show me evolution in that. OK, so here's a mammal. This is the horse. We have a really good fossil record of the horse, most of whose evolution took place in North America. Horses form a branching bush, just like many organisms do. There's no single lineage of horse. But if you follow some lineages, you see evolutionary change. One famous lineage is the one that goes from the, this common ancestor, Hyracotherium, a cute little animal about this big, evolving into the modern horse. And you see all kinds of evolutionary changes occurring on that lineage. It loses its toes, starts off with five toes, the two outer ones disappear, then the two middle ones disappear, and you're left with one toe left. It's an example of evolution. That's for creation. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but they don't all do that. It's not like every lineage of horse is forced to do this. Some of the lineages get smaller. So we see this branching bush, the speciation event, and in following some lineages, we see evolutionary change. OK, I'm not going to bore you to death by showing you example after example after example. You can go to my book, or you can go to Richard's book to see that. Okay? Let's go to some other predictions that evolution makes. Take the one on common ancestry and speciation. Okay. If all creatures share common ancestry, as Darwin maintained in 1858, where there was no evidence at the time, what do you expect to see? Well, we should be able to find some evidence of those common ancestors. We should be able to go back in time and see lineages converging and things that are supposed to be related, we should be able to find their common ancestor. Okay? We should be able to find these transitional forms. Okay? Now, two of the groups that evolution, that morphologists, people that study the way animals look and physiologists the way their bodies work, have told us before Darwin's time that birds appear to be closely related to reptiles. There's a number of similarities in the way their hearts are structured, in the way their, um, their circulatory systems are structured, that makes us think that perhaps um, birds evolved from reptiles. And we see reptiles early in the fossil record and no birds. And later on, about 150 million years ago, we still have reptiles, but now we, ha we see birds for the first time. So if it's true that birds came from reptiles, we should be able to find a common ancestor between those two. That's a prediction, OK? It was not known to be true. It was not known to be verified in Darwin's time. It was predicted, OK? So what we would like to see is a common ancestor of birds and reptiles, that one species, all of whose descendants on one branch gave rise to reptiles, the other descendants gave rise to birds. Now, finding a single species in the fossil record is almost impossible, given that less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of all species that ever lived we know as fossils, due to the vagaries of fossilization, preservation, and erosion. But what we can hope to find, even if we can't find this single species, is at least what we call transitional forms. If birds did evolve from reptiles, then their early ancestors were reptilian, and they later became more bird-like. So somewhere along that branch, we should be able to see some creatures that show features of both reptiles and birds. Okay. 
This was, again, there were none known in Darwin's time. There actually was the famous Archaeopteryx fossil, um, which was tattooed on a young lady I saw yesterday, um, <laughs> half Bill Myers' friend, um, half bird, half reptile. But Darwin didn't realize its significance. And now in the last 20 or 30 years, we've been able actually to find these transitional forms. What better example of um, an evolutionary prediction fulfilled can you imagine? Here's one of them. This is found in China in very fine still sediments. This is Sinornithosaurus millennii. I think this is about 150 million years old. It may be, I'll get to date in a minute. Um, if you know your dinosaurs, this looks very much like a theropod dinosaur. Those two-legged bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs like T. rex, there are many of them. Birds are supposed to evolve from little ones. This is one of them, and you can see right off that this looks like uh, a reptile. It has teeth. You can see the teeth there. Its front limbs are free. If you look at a chicken wing, the digits are all fused. This one, they're all free like a lizard. And it has this long bony tail. Okay. So it looks for all the world like a theropod dinosaur. But thanks to the sediments in which this thing was preserved, it's um, feathers. You can see feather imprints right there. Okay. And so what we have here is a feathered dinosaur. And in the last 20 or 30 years, we've been digging these up with increasing frequency. Um, the one was found about two weeks ago, which is even earlier than this. Moreover, not only do they fulfill all the features of a transitional form, they're, they're reptiles, but they have feathers on them, they occur at the right time in the fossil record. This is about 125 million years ago, well after dinosaurs had already existed, but before modern birds appeared. So it's not just that it's intermediate in appearance, but it's intermediate in when we see it occur in the fossil record. If this thing lived 500 million years ago, it's not a good candidate for a bird reptile transitional form. What did this look like? Probably something like that. This is an imaginative reconstruction. In fact, T. rex itself may have been covered with fluff. We're not sure, but they don't display that in the museums because it takes away its fearsome aspects. Okay. Another example of these transitional forms, which were only recently found, were whales, which were long thought to have evolved from land animals, land animals much like the water chevrotain or a hippopotamus, so-called artiodactyls or even-toed animals. Um, but there were no missing intermediates. And in fact, if you look at the creationist literature about 30 years ago, you're going to see, well, they tell us that, uh, that whales evolved from something like cows. Well, that's just stupid. What would that look like? And then creationists just show a slide of an animal that the front half was a, was a heifer and the rear half was a fish. And the thing would be standing in the water with a question mark over its head, like, where am I supposed to go? And, and everybody would laugh and say, well, that's just stupid. Evolutionists cannot possibly hold such ridiculous ideas. And then people began going to the Middle East and prospecting, and they began to find, first of all, ancestors of whales, things like the water shepherd pain, which looked very much like the thing that could develop into a aquatic animal. Whales are secondarily aquatic. They come from the water. I mean, they come from the land onto the water. And now we have this whole sequence of things that occur not only in morphological sequence, from things that were sort of hanging around the edge of the water, sort of going into the water with a little bit reduction of the rear limbs, evaluate evolution of the front limbs. Here's a picture of one of these things. And finally, things that are losing their rear limbs and becoming more and more aquatic all the way down to modern fully formed whales. All this action takes place in perfect temporal sequence. The earliest forms are the most temp terrestrial. The latest forms are more aquatic. All in 10 million years. Okay. So it took us to go from like a, a land mammal, like a small horse to a whale in 10 million years. That's not much longer than it took humans to evolve from our common ancestor of the chimpanzees. So this is very rapid evolution. This is an absolute confirmation of the truth of evolution, at least in this lineage. OK. Whoops, I think I missed it. Go back. I think I'm, OK, I'm missing a slide here. Sorry about that. Um, it was a slide of a, let's see if I can recover that one more time. No, I didn't. It was a slide of a dolphin having re-evolved hind legs, the atavisms that occasionally occur. Anyway, besides the predictions that I'm talking about, evolution also makes what I call retrodictions. That is, it doesn't necessarily predict phenomena, but there are bizarre phenomena that crop up that can be understood only in light of evolution. Here's one of them. This is an embryology. This is an embryo of a spotted dolphin at age 24 days. And if you look closely, you'll see that there are limb buds on this thing. As with all tetrapods, four-footed vertebrates, 
it begins life developing four limbs and hind limbs. And you can see both of them. Now you know that a spotted dolphin doesn't have hind limbs. It, it, they disappear, what happens. But they begin evolving in development. So anyway, this looks very much like an early human because all vertebrate embryos start out the same way. It has four limbs and hind limbs. What happens is if you follow this thing embryologically, let's say look at it for another three weeks, the four limbs continue to enlarge to form paddles and the hind limbs go away. Okay, now why is that? You have to ask yourself, why would an animal that only has two functioning limbs, the four limbs of the dolphin, begin to develop rear ones and then they disappear? Is this, if you're a creationist, you have to explain this. You can say, well, we don't know what those limb buds are, even though in all other tetrapods, those develop into the legs. And may, or maybe the creator is trying to fool us into thinking that dolphins evolved like whales from terrestrial animals. But really, it makes sense from the view, and we can now support this with fossils, that, embryo, that dolphins evolved from animals that had four legs and lost the rear two. Sorry, and here's the missing slide. There's a dolphin. This is an atavistic mutant dolphin, and look at that, it has two hind legs right where the limb buds are developed. In this case, the limb buds failed to go away, they continued to develop into some sort of rudimentary hind limbs. This is very rare. These two things that you see in the dolphin, those aren't there on dolphins usually. If you dissect them, you find limb bones in them. What's the explanation? Retrodiction. Evolution makes sense of this, creationism doesn't. Okay. It's not necessarily predicted, but it's something that makes sense only in light of evolution. Here's something that we have. One of our bizarre embryological features, every one of you at the age of six months developed a thick coat of hair on your body called the lanugo. And you can look this up in pediatric textbooks. The doctors always mention it. They never say what it means. Why at the age of six months do we develop a thick coat of hair in the embryo, which is then shed shortly before birth? If you're born prematurely, you sometimes are born with this coat of hair, but it always goes away. What does it mean that we develop this feature and lose it? How does it make sense? Well, if you're a creationist, it does not make sense. And I'm not trying to bash creationists here, although I really am. <laughs> what, I'm trying to do is, is, what I'm trying to do is rule out the, other, the alternative hypothesis that's in opposition to evolution, which is that God made this stuff for some celestial being. Well, why would God put hair in an embryo that's floating around in water that's 37 degrees centigrade or 98.6? It has no adaptive significance at all. You don't need hair when you're immersed in liquid that's at your body temperature. Well, if you look at a juvenile ape or a chimpanzee, at about the same stage of development, it begins to develop hair too. And then it loses it. We start to do the same thing. Sorry, the chimpanzee keeps the hair, and the gorilla keeps the hair, our relatives do. We lose it. So it makes sense in view of we probably descended from animals that were hairy, like chimps and gorillas. And we've, we're now the naked ape but we've aborted that hair development, not from the outset, but at a certain stage of development. We have many vestigial organs that can only be explained by evolution. Here's one of them. If you look at whale skeletons in natural history museums hanging from the top, you'll often see these two limb bones suspended from the bottom. They're not connected to the rest of the skeleton. They're hanging there by wires. Why are they there? They don't seem to have any function at all. Well, any embryologist or morphologist would say, well, those are the remnants of the vestigial limbs, those are the bones that are the remnants of the rear legs that this, which is a gray whale, used to have. Okay. Well, you can say, well, how do you know that? Maybe they're just struts for the penis. That's what the creationists call them. They're supporting the phallus. Okay. Well, that's the way they get around this sort of thing. Well, you can say, well, maybe, but they were just in the right place and they developed from the right time. And sometimes development goes wrong and you get something like this there. This is the... Uh, vestigial hind limb of a humpback whale discovered in the 1920s that happened to not stop developing but kept growing. And in that thing you can discern a femur, a tibia, and the tarsal bones, which are of the foot. This is the thing, you can see the scale there, it's a couple feet long. So this is clearly not a penis strut, it's the remnants of an ancestral leg. Sometimes development goes awry and a lot of the leg continues to develop. But it doesn't come back in full form because the genes that make a real leg have somewhat degraded over you can make a prediction from that. Okay, those are retrodictions. Here's a prediction. If you see a vestigial feature in an organism, then there might be vestigial genes behind it. That is, if a feature is degenerated or go away, then if you looked at the genome of that organism, maybe you could find the genes that used to produce that feature somewhat degraded or in degraded form. And here's a really good example of this that was only discovered this year. This has been known for some time. This is a four 
month, sorry, four week old human fetus, um, looks fish like, and lo and behold, it's got a yolk sac, just like a turtle, just like an egg, in, a chicken and an egg. We have a yolk sac too. You can notice, however, that it's empty, there's nothing in it, it doesn't do anything. It's a vestigial feature, it's a remnant of when we used to be, share, our genes were shared with those of turtles and birds and other reptiles. Okay. But you can predict from this, well, we, we have a yolk sac. Yolk sacs are filled with yolk. There should be genes for yolk in the human genome somewhere. We don't make yolk, but evolution does not work by taking it, removing entire genes out of DNA. We, now, there's no way that we know that an entire gene can be neatly taken out of DNA by, the, by natural selection. It's usually degraded by mutations or things like that. So now that we can sequence genomes, and in the human genome in particular, lo and behold, what do we find? We have three genes to make egg yolk. All of them are broken. They have pieces missing, so they're not expressed. What, how else could a creationist explain egg yolk genes in a human that are broken, except that we inherited those things from our common ancestor that did make yolk? Okay. We have other broken genes, genes for making vitamin C, olfactory receptor genes. Our ancestors and a lot of our relatives, like rabbits and chimpanzees, not chimpanzees, but um, horses can make vitamin C, humans can't do it. We have all the equipment necessary to do it, but the last gene in the step is broken. Okay. Why would a, a celestial being put genes into our genome that don't serve any function at all, and in fact are degraded? A lot of the genes that make our sniffing proteins, olfactory receptors, are dead. They're broken. They're remnants of the time when we used to be nocturnal insectivores millions of years ago and really needed that sniffing power to get around in our environment. We're visual animals, not olfactory ones. We don't need to sniff so well. The genes are degraded, but they're still there in this vast cemetery of dead genes in our genome. And finally, some retrodictions from biogeography. I'll go over these very quickly. There are features about the development of the biogeography is the study of the distribution of plants and animals on the surface of the earth. And there are peculiarities about where these animals and plants are distributed that can only be explained by evolution. I'm only going to one of them. This is oceanic islands. The kind of life present on oceanic islands is indicative of evolution and cannot be explained by any kind of creationism. Here's one of them. This is Lord Howe. An oceanic island is defined as an island that rises de novo from beneath the sea, bereft of life, like uh, Monty Python's parrot. And, and the life on there must have come from somewhere else if you're an evolutionary biologist. There are continental islands that are not like this, for example, Madagascar and Great Britain, but the world is filled with oceanic islands like Lord Howe, the Galapagos, and Hawaii. And if you look at the kinds of plants and animals on these islands, and this is what Darwin did on his Beagle voyage, you find peculiarities. There are kinds of animals that are missing from these islands. Over and over again, you do not see any mammals. You can go to the Galapagos, you can go to Hawaii. There are no endemic mammals living on those islands. And yet continental islands, like Great Britain or like Madagascar, have endemic mammals. Okay. Now why is that? Creationists will say, well, these, these islands aren't fit for the occupation by mammals, amphibians and fish. God didn't want them to be there. But of course, they are there, and they, when they get there introduced by man, they go crazy. These are two of the animals that are currently destroying Hawaii, the mongoose and the cane toad, an amphibian and a mammal respectively, and they're doing just great. So the fact that they're not there in the first place doesn't mean it wasn't suitable for there, or that God just didn't put them there because they weren't useful. It's because, almost certainly, they didn't get there. And then when you see the kind of life that is there, like plants, birds, and insects, you see very clearly that the kinds of life that are endemic to oceanic islands are the kinds of life that could get there in the first place through long-distance dispersal and evolve. It's easy for a plant or a bird or insects which could fly or float, to get to a distant island and evolve there. It's almost impossible for a, a freshwater fish, an amphibian, or a mammal to make it to a distant island and evolve. Moreover, the kinds of life present on those oceanic islands are those that are usually found on the nearest mainland. Why the resemblance of the fauna of the Galapagos to that of the coast of South America? How can you explain that? It's not that the, cl the climate or the habitat is similar, Ecuador is tropical and wet and hot. The Galapagos are hot, but they're dry and, um, and almost waterless and vegetationless. It's that they're related and that the inhabitants of the Galapagos, like the inhabitants of all these oceanic islands, as opposed to those from continental islands, came there 
by rare dispersal events from the nearest mainland. So biogeography is one of the most powerful pieces of evidence for evolution. I have a chapter in my book. Richard does as well. Okay, now, another thing which creationists really hate as evidence for evolution is bad design. And almost any animal or plant is just a mess if you cut it open and look at it inside. We're just, I mean, we're not intelligently designed in any respect. And you can pick out numerous features of our bodies, our bad backs, the way childbirth occurs, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, etc. Here's just one example of bad design, which testifies to evolution. You would predict that if a feature is evolved, you're going to get jury-rigged features, things that don't make sense, that an engineer would not put in an animal or a plant that way, but that you would expect to find if things had to go from one state to another along a completely adaptive slope. The most famous, well, at least for males of my age, is the prostate gland. The prostate gland is a miracle of bad engineering. Only a moron engineer would design an organ that's prone to swelling that is, surrounds a collapsible pipe, okay? <laughs> Actually, Robin Williams describes this in one of his more forgettable movies. He says it's like running a sewage pipe through a playground. Okay. And we know what the consequences of this bad design are. It's that when you're a male of a certain age, and if you're a male of a certain age, you'll experience this, or if you watch the evening news, you'll know about this, that that organ tends to swell up in later age, restricts the flow of urine, you have the going, going, going syndrome, it hurts, and other bad things can happen. It's simply bad design. It makes no sense from an engineering standpoint. It makes perfect sense from an evolution standpoint because we know from embryology and other things that the prostate gland evolved from the walls of the urethra that it surrounds. So that organ that surrounds the pipe actually evolved from the pipe in the first place. So it makes sense in evolution. And finally, the last thing, prediction I want to make is if evolution results largely from natural selection, we should be able to see examples of natural selection operating in nature. Okay, this is a tough one because natural selection is slow. It's not always operating in every species. It takes many thousands of years to change species. To ask that we see it in real time in organisms other than bacteria is a big request. But nevertheless, we've been able to find it. Um, over 300 cases have been analyzed. The most famous series of them is in John Endler's book called Natural Selection in the Wild, where you can see his famous table two, case after case after case of natural selection being described in the wild. I won't bore you with them. If you want to read more, the most famous case is in the medium ground finch of the Galapagos, Geospiza fortis, which is described in Jonathan Wiener's Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Beak of the Finch. So if you want to see a well-designed case of natural selection acting to change the finch, when, the, when it got drier, the, the seeds got bigger and harder, the finches had to get bigger and bigger beaks to deal with them, and lo and behold, that's what happened. This is a good case. Okay. So, to sum up all the evidence from now, I hope I've shown you that the evidence comes from many areas of biology. First of all, the fossil record. This is what you always think of when you think of the evidence for evolution, but even if we did not have a single fossil, we would still know that evolution we have vestigial organs whose existence can be explained only if organisms had common ancestors. We have these quirks of development, like the, our hairy coat at the age of six months, or the transitory appearance of limb buds in the spotted dolphin. This comes from embryology. We have bad design, the prostate gland, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, our bad backs, which have not yet cut up with our erect posture. We have the evidence from biogeography, the fact that life is very strange on islands that poke their heads above the sea when there wasn't any life on them in the first place. And we have examples of natural selection in real time. All these different areas of biology, and it involves both predictions and retrodictions. Okay. We can both predict what we're going to find and meet those predictions, and we can also find things that are puzzling, except if evolution were true. We have, sub we have found evidence for evolutionary change itself, for the gradual ch gradualness of evolutionary change, for speciation or splitting, for common ancestry, and for natural selection. That's all the parts of the theory that I've described. Where else can you conclude? It's true. Okay. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's just as true as this. And if you don't believe it, read my book, read Richard's book, and then come back to me. And if you still don't believe it, 
I don't want to have anything to do with you. <laughs> One more thing before I get to the explanation, and I have a few minutes left here. Um, it's not only true in that the predictions and retrodictions make sense only if evolution were true, but there are many things that could also have falsified the theory of evolution. And I've made a list here of a number of things that if we observed any of them in any kind of numbers, it would show that Darwinism is true. I'm not going to go through these. Um, the most famous one is if we saw fossils in the wrong place. Um, a Precambrian human being down in 400 million, I'm sorry, 500 million years ago, any fossils out of order would disprove evolution. If we found an adaptation in one species that was not good for that species but was only good for a second species, well, that isn't predicted by the theory of evolution either. And there's all these other things. The lack of genetic variation would show that there's no ability for natural selection to change plants and animals. We don't find any of these things, okay? We've never observed one of them. So there's been a million chances for natural selection to be wrong. And it has never been wrong. It always comes up right. This is additional evidence that we're dealing with something that is true. Okay. So that's, that's the QED. I'm done with the evidence. But I want to talk a little bit about, well, if this is so true, why is there so much resistance to this in the United States? After all, we're 33rd out of 34 technologically advanced countries in accepting evolution. We're scientifically elite, we're supposed to be smart, we're supposed to be savvy, we're supposed to be open-minded. What's the reason? Well, I know you've all thought of this before. Um, the obvious hypothesis is religion. And because, our, well, one reason you can say this is because almost all of the opposition to teaching evolution in our country comes from people who are religious and who believe that the theory of evolution or the fact of evolution violates their religious faith. Okay. How do we prove that, though? I mean, you can say, well, it's just, you know, there's too many problems with evolution. Well, one thing you can do is plot on a single plot. You take those 34 countries and you plot how religious each country is on the x-axis here, down at the bottom, against the proportion of people that accept the theory of evolution. And you can see that it forms this nice downward curve. This is, if you know statistics, this is highly statistically significant. There's a strong negative relationship amongst those 34 countries between how religious you are and how much, how many of your citizens accept Darwin. There, by the way, is the United States. Um, we're second lowest next to Turkey in terms of accepting evolution. Okay, so we do, so we see here what we predict, that the more religious a country is, the less likely its citizens are to accept evolution. What does that mean? Well, there's two explanations. Remember, everybody started down here in the 1850s. Probably almost everybody believed in God, and nobody believed in evolution, because there wasn't evolution. And then the line somehow became like this. There's kind of two explanations for that. First of all, you could say, well, the countries whose citizens accepted God, evolution more gave up, gave up, gave up God, okay? Because the more and more you accept evolution, the less and less you are to accept God. And that's what accounts for this negative relationship. And that may be true to some extent. After all, a lot of us, like myself and probably Richard as well, um, lost our faith or what little faith we had when we learned about evolution. It just doesn't make any sense. But it seems more likely that what this really reflects is that those countries that are more religious than others for other reasons, having nothing to do with Darwin, are less accepting of the theory of evolution because it violates what they know about or what the creation stories are that their religions tell them. And this is supported by statistics, at least in the United States. A recent poll asked Americans who were religious, if a fact, scientific fact were found that contravenes the dictates of your religion, would you accept the scientific fact or would you reject it and believe what your religion said? And two out of three people said they would reject the scientific fact. So this shows that adhering to religious dogma means that you are less willing to accept Darwinism. And I think that's what these lines reflect. Countries like the United States, which is very religious, or Turkey right here, or Cyprus, um, simply, its citizens simply are so imbued in religious dogma that they're unwilling to accept the fact of evolution. Okay, so this is the line. So what you can conclude from this, maybe, is that I'm wasting my time talking to you and writing books about evolution. So what we should really be doing is getting rid of religion. Because it's religion that's the real block here. But wait, wait, I'm not, I'm not through yet. Because that, I don't know if it'll work for another reason I'll say in my last slide. 
Um, you'd have to get rid of a lot of religion to get acceptance of Darwinism. This line is inelastic with respect to accepting Darwinism. You have to give up 35% of your belief in God to increase your acceptance of evolution by 10%, right? <laughs> so you have to become almost completely atheistic before most of the countries, most of your citizens are going to accept evolution. So I could say, okay, and this is one reason on my website and other places, I decided to move a little bit away from defending evolution to going to what I see as blocks to rationality, which is religion. Okay, so, get rid of religion, the problem is solved. We all accept Darwinism as a pleiotropic byproduct. Well, that's not necessarily so easy. Because why do these countries differ in their religious belief in the first place? And here's a study that just came out recently by Greg Paul. Um, it hasn't been, I mean, it's gone through peer review. I haven't heard any commentary on it. But what he did is, among 17 countries, he, he calculated what he called the successful society index. It is how good is a, this is a society as a harmonious group of people that takes care of itself and is not dysfunctional. So a successful society is one that has, for example, not so many homicides, not so much venereal disease, um, not, so, not so much uh, divorce. Um, not so, health, oh, yeah, health care is another one, right. <laughs> yeah. And health care, of course, um, suicide, and the proportion of its population incarcerated, the, the less you have of that, the more successful you are in a society. This, by the way, was not calculated to make the United States look bad. By all accounts, we think we're a successful society. We're not, if you look at the scale. Um, oops, sorry, press this. Well, that's, the, that's a really steep line. You can see the countries at the top are like Denmark, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Holland, and then there's the United States and Italy. Oh, sorry, you can't hear me? Okay. So that's the relationship, and that's where the U.S. is. Now look at the x-axis. Belief in God correlated with successful society index. Strong negative relationship. Those societies that tend to be more religious are the ones that are dysfunctional. If you look at an objective criterion for dysfunctionality. Okay. Now why is this? Two explanations. Well, maybe the more you believe in God, the less likely you are to try to make your society a functional one. And you can make stories about Republicans opposing health care and abortions and things like that. But Paul has another explanation, which I tend to agree with, that those societies which, for whatever reasons, tend to take care of their citizens and be harmonious and tend to allow things like abortions and health care for everybody and lock up fewer of its citizens, in those societies you feel secure and well off and you don't need to turn to a sky father for your security and welfare. You don't need to pray for being, for being cured because you can go to government-run medical clinics. And so that's his explanation of this correlation. Okay, and there's the United States. So, my conclusion overall is if this relationship is true and the explanation I just offered is true, then the real way to increase the teaching of evolution and the acceptance of evolution in our country is to not necessarily to get rid of religion, but to get rid of religion by building a more harmonious, just, and caring society. That's not only a nobler goal than making people accept Darwin, it's also a goal that all of us, whether we're scientists or not, can help achieve, and I assume that that's one of the reasons why we're here. Thank you.